I would like to just start by saying hi there and welcome to this plenary session at the Horizons India virtual meeting entitled Post-COVID Repositioning Capitalism. Uh, my name is Rosalind Matheson. I work with Bloomberg News in London and it's my pleasure to be here today as your moderator to facilitate the discussion with our four esteemed panelists, one who should be joining us uh, imminently. I'll just begin by talking for a few minutes and then asking each of our panelists to talk for about three minutes after which we'll move to a discussion uh, for about half an hour. Uh, we are, of course, still in the midst of this global pandemic. Confirmed infections are nearly 9 million people worldwide. The virus has claimed more than 460,000 lives. Several countries are battling the prospect of second waves, even as they grapple with how and when to reopen their economies and to help businesses safely resume operations. At the same time, a crisis of this magnitude presents a moment to think about what work actually looks like what companies look like and what societies and governments look like. Is this the chance now for a reset? As this session description sets out, is there a way to become more sustainable, more inclusive, more long-term oriented, while ensuring that economies can get up to speed as soon as possible? And while of course limiting the debt burdens that are already coming onto the government books in many countries because of this. I was struck by something that the Nobel laureate economist Joseph Stiglitz said recently, which is that business as usual is not an option. Uh, and his quote was, it shouldn't be just going back to where we were. And when we think about a country like India, and indeed many others, there are fundamental questions about safety nets and about the tenuous hold that many already have on their work. India, again, like many other countries, has a large informal and migratory workforce. And what has COVID-19 shown us about those structural vulnerabilities? What has it shown us about economic models? What is, where does that leave the education system? And what is feasible going forward? So we'll talk today about those things and what it means to be a company in this era of COVID and beyond, about what kinds of companies will succeed and how they'll adapt and the challenges that will no doubt continue. So I'll call our panelists, as I said, one by one to give some brief introductory remarks. I'd like to turn first to Dr. Mukesh Aghi, who is President and CEO of the US-India Strategic Partnership Forum. He's joining us today from the US. I'll hand over to you, thank you. Thank you, Rosalind, and uh, good morning, good evening to everybody. Uh, what we see is post-COVID, more of a realignment of global order. And we will see a lot of regional powers coming into play, which means that it is gonna have an impact on the economic aspect of India also. Within India, what we, within Asia, what we're seeing is a rise of China. And we also see that China will want to dominate the region uh, in, in both economically and militarily itself. So it will be a challenge for India while trying to drive this vision of a $5 trillion economy Try also managing its neighbor, which has a border, which has a disputed uh, line of demarcation on itself. I think uh, what we see is for India to grow, it has to still depend on FDI. And we estimate roughly $100 billion annual FDI commitment coming in to India on a global basis to, for it to achieve its $5 trillion economic vision. That's important. Also, I think from a geopolitical perspective, India has to look at its quad relationship much more seriously. When I say quad relationship, that is Japan, Australia, US, and India itself. And, and while it's focused on Indo-Pacific region quad perspective, it has to percolate this down to the economic alignment also. So you need to have an economic quad when I say economic quad, you look at Japan, a $5 trillion economy, Australia, $1.5 trillion economy, U.S., over $22 trillion economy, mm -hmm. and India, slightly over $3 trillion economy. You know, the combination of these uh, will create a very strong, powerful region itself. And you can add more, but I think you can percolate from a defense quad into economic quad. And what, that, what do I mean by that? I think we need to be able to sign some kind of a FTA between these countries. So there is mobility of IT workers 
from India into the U.S. There is ease of moving uh, generic drugs and other pharma drugs from India into the U.S. From the U.S., you uh, are able to bring energy, defense equipment into India itself. Partner with Japan from an infrastructure perspective, from a capital perspective. Partner with Australia from a technology. So I think this economic cord we see coming through. Finally, I just want to say that uh, when we look at uh, the post-COVID order, uh, India will not be handed its position. India has to muscle its way, trying to get its role uh, defined and, and get that role. And we saw that last week in the UN uh, Permanent Security Council, where India was able to uh, basically collaborate basi- uh, almost 180 countries to vote for India's position in the, uh, in the United Nations Security Council. So what we see is is a turbulence slightly, but I think if India can get the allies together, both from a geopolitical perspective and also from an economic perspective, then its future is very, very bright. Thank you for those remarks. Uh, the panellists, you might be able to see questions that are coming up on the screen on the right, um, specifically addressed to you as you're talking. Feel free to address those. Um, in your conversations. Um, I'd like to turn now uh, to Hank McKinnell, who is a director at Moody's and was also a former CEO and chairman of the board of directors at Pfizer, who's managed to join us now. So Hank, if you'd like to give us some introductory remarks, please, and the rest of us will mute ourselves. Thank you. Thank you, Rosalind. Uh, Probably the best thing I can do is give you a US perspective on this issue. Uh, The Business Roundtable is uh, a group of the chief executive officers of the largest companies in America, about 200 in total. Uh, They represent some 70% of economic activity in the private sector and represent the private sector in uh, negotiations with government on tax policy and other issues. Uh, I chaired that group for three terms, and they issued a statement in August, which surprised a lot of people, because for a hundred years, business has thought of themselves as representing the shareholders. They were operating the business in the interests of the shareholders. But this statement actually went much beyond that, uh, saying basically that business serves shareholders, but also serves society, employees, customers, suppliers, a much broader view of the view of the private sector in economies. Now, why did this happen? Well, it happened because the world changed. Uh, Even investors were no longer satisfied by business focusing on returns to shareholders. Uh, They realized that, in their view, management was not paying enough attention to ESG, environment, society, and governance. Uh, it's kind of become a big E because that's what's that's where the focus has been. Uh, but similarly, there's a number of other issues uh, from certainly right now, Black Lives Matter to income inequality to uh, uh, some of the First Amendment freedom to speech issues that are being addressed in the United States now. It was a recognition that all of those stakeholder groups uh, needed to be addressed. Uh, And the reason for that is maybe threefold. Uh, Number one is employees like to work for a company that's uh, respected in the community. And that's the way you get uh, employees most committed to the purposes of the organization. Uh, It's also true if you're seen as part of the problem, uh, you'll be treated as a problem. If you're treated as a part of the solution to issues that are of importance to people, Uh, you'll be treated much more kindly. And finally, if you're seen as a problem in society, you will lose in legislation, litigation, and regulation. So this change in philosophy of the purpose of a corporation was in response to a change in expectations in the society. Now, the problem with this is it creates serious operational and oversight uh, problems, both for management operating the business and boards of directors overseeing uh, those activities on behalf of shareholders. Uh, But I think I'll leave that for a little later in this discussion and close with those introductory remarks. Thank you. 
Thanks very much, Hank. Yeah, we want to come back to that in the discussion, certainly the operational challenges for companies in adopting a different kind of model or a different kind of value of seeing their workforce. Um, I'd like to turn over now to Vineet Nayo, who is co-founder of the Sampark Foundation, who is with us today uh, from India for some introductory remarks. Thank you. Uh, good morning, good evening, and good afternoon to everybody. Uh, one of the critical aspects of the impact of coronavirus is on the economy, and I think uh, we will talk extensively about it. But I want you to bring, I want to bring your attention to one other aspect, which is the human aspect, uh, which is troubling me big time. Uh, this is the state of education and what is going to happen to education if the coronavirus impact is not checked. Uh, one of the issues which you keep hearing about the migrant population moving back to villages, uh, it has two impacts on education. Number one, uh, many people are taking their children out from private schools uh, and putting them in government schools because their earning capability has gone down. And therefore, and as you are aware, the government school infrastructure in India is not as robust as the private school. So we are going to see impact on education on one scale there. Number two, a lot of migrant population has moved from the urban areas to rural areas. And the rural government schools are far worse off than the urban schools, uh, because of which you will see a double whammy on the education. Now, already we have a system where 144 million children in our common schools uh, cannot read and write or cannot construct simple sentences or count numbers beyond 99, even in grade five. And with this compounded migrant migration movement towards what we call low infrastructure school, I and possibly the one one year gap year uh, in education, I started to think the impact, the long term impact it will have on our economy because it will produce unemployable people rather than unemployed people. So while we are focused on here and now, which is do people globalize or do countries become uh, inward looking? Uh, what happens in the next quarter economy, retail data, and what happens to the company, or what happens on the health index? I would say that to me, my biggest concern is what happens on the long term basis if we drop off 144 million children for even one year and they do not do education for one year, what would happen? In India, 37% of children drop out of school at grade five. And if that 37% goes to 50% or 55% because of coronavirus, we will have a massive problem in the coming years. So I think we should discuss the impact of coronavirus on geopolitics, on the way the business will get constructed. But I believe that the business will take care of themselves. Maybe a year later they'll come back, maybe two years later they'll come back. But the human capital and the impact on human capital, we should not be caught. Thank you. Thank you. And just um, a request um, to every to our panelists, if you could mute yourself if you're not talking. Um, there's a little bit of noise coming through on the line, particularly just with our speaker just now. Um, if I could now turn, of course, to Preetha Reddy, who needs no introduction to many of you. She's Vice Chair of Apollo Hospitals. Uh, Preetha, if you could uh, bring it to a close for this part of the panel by uh, your introductory remarks. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation and uh, my best wishes to everybody around the world, especially in these troubled times, but we know that, you know, I'm hoping you're all safe and well. I come from a healthcare background and uh, everybody says, you know, we know nothing except uh, healthcare and I guess that's true because that, that's all we do uh, from our company. But, uh, I, you know, it's, it's a pleasure to be with all of you and try and share some perspectives on what is happening and what we think the new normal should be. It is said that in the course of history, there comes a time when humanity is called to shift to a new level of consciousness, to reach a higher moral ground maybe, or you know, partnerships which will bring strength, and definitely a level of consciousness on humanity, on 
the environment and the economics of doing business because it's not business as usual as we all seem to know and realize. But capitalism itself, I think, is looking to be repositioned because everything seems to have bottomed, up, bottomed out in terms of businesses. And we, we're seeing green shoots, you know, whether we see it in education or a new way to deliver healthcare or, you know, manufacturing itself. Is it a better and a newer way? Can we design for the future? I think these are thoughts which which are happening now in C-suites and boardrooms. And these are things which we will see happening in the future. But the old way of business as usual doesn't seem to, to be the norm anymore. We are seeing paradoxes in capitalism, you know, just in this sca scanning global economies. And South Korea seems to be a great example the way they tackle the disease of COVID, the way there's a discipline in the community, and how they design for the future or industrialize themselves. So South Korea actually went from poverty to prosperity and at breakneck speed. And we can see the power of capitalism, but more than anything else, even the Korean physique seems to have changed. The nation, while it's growing richer, the people have actually grown two inches taller. So, you know, they're doing something right. But then there is a paradox because now they're finding it hard to look, to see what they can do with the growing elders. Growing population of elders now seems a big problem. So we see economy growing, but the paradox in, you know, uh, in the ge geriatric population. Similarly, we're seeing, you know, differences in the way things are being done. Like on one side, when it's growing very well, we see another issue coming up and now we have to deal with that. India has dealt with the COVID situation for a country of 1.3 billion relatively well. And if we look at the data and we focus, it has been centered around the larger cities. It has been centered around the you know, the deep clusters of population. And that's where we're seeing, in a way, community spread. But are we dealing with it? I think uh, we're coming to terms with it, number one. We're trying to bridge the gap between the public and the private sector because I think that really is the way to reposition the future. That unless there is, there are partnerships within the country externally, and within government and the private sector, which, you know, for a long time has not happened enough in, in, uh, in India. You know, while we talk about public-private partnerships, they aren't that many. It is not the, no, the new normal yet. Uh, it's, we find very few examples of where public-private partnership works. So can we really remove the divide between the public and the private sector and be fast and furious about it? would probably be a new way of looking looking at things. Can India really, because us is the largest English-speaking population, can we really scale for the, for the future? Can we scale, for me it's healthcare workers, but can we scale for teachers? Can we scale for healthcare workers, nurses, doctors, uh, you know, technicians? Can we do that? I think we can, but we need to plan to be able to do it. And we need support certain norms uh, and we should be able to do it. Do we need reforms in our country? I really think we do. Uh, legal, land, labor reforms to make it more contemporary, to really make it a country which will you know, keep pace with the rest of the world should be done and I think you know, people in power are really looking at it. Education and health is a fundamental right. Uh, are we doing enough to provide universal health care for people? The present government has done phenomenally well in that. Nowhere else has there been, you know, within a span of one year, uh, 10 million of, of our population now have access to high-end health care. And I think Ayushman Bharat has been the largest, most path-breaking, uh, innovative insurance program which has happened globally. So can we do more of that? I'm sure we can, but but again, it's about you know thinking together, designing together, working together to be able to do it. I also wonder if the private equity investors 
who always look at double digit returns, maybe for the next five years, can they really look at high single digit returns? Because every country has gone through issues, every country has gone through problems. But we really have to build capital for the future. We can't lose the capital of the present. And I think if there is more which is growth oriented in terms of investment rather than return oriented, which again is you know a newer way of thinking, but I think a much needed way of thinking, we might do well for the future. But having said that, I think we are positioned with our workforce to take care of you know, the growing geriatric population, to skill for the rest of the world, and maybe soon to even manufacture uh, you know, in, within our country. And we're looking forward to a time to do it, but to be able to actually do it, it needs partnerships. Uh, traditionally, India has partnered and done very well with the US. Uh, a lot of Indians are US citizens. Um, they, they're probably our best brand ambassadors and partners. So can we really work more with the European nations? Can we work with the US to, to change the way capitalism is happening within this region is, is what I would look forward to. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and thank you all for your opening remarks. Uh, I actually wanted to circle back to something uh, that Dr. Agni was talking about and some of the questions that are coming in are referencing, um, which is the idea of India's relationships um, in a post-COVID world um, or even through this moment uh, and, how, and how important cooperation is and the risk that countries do not cooperate in these times, which we're seeing and going back into competition uh, in many ways. Uh, and, and further to that, how realistic is it with India being to some extent purpose of a services-based economy, when you think about the, the opportunity to disrupt supply chains in different ways, perhaps to India's advantage, is that something that companies uh, in India as a whole, you believe, is positioned to do or thinking about at this point in time? Well, I think you have to look at the track record. Uh, if, since the uh, IT services export market picked up after Y2K, India has brought over a trillion dollar worth of efficiency to U.S. companies on a global basis and makes them much more efficient, effective, and competitive. That's one. You look at from a pharma perspective, uh, today all the major pharma companies, including Pfizer, uh, have R&D centers, and these U.S. pharma companies, along with other electronic companies, are generating almost 70% of the patents coming out of India. And when you look at beyond that, so I think uh, India's capital, which is human, uh, is one of the most cost-effective in the world, and, and the world can take advantage of that. Indians don't have to fly down to United States or Europe, other geographies, they are able to create clusters of excellence within India itself and produce world-class, cost-effective product and services on a global basis. And I think we need to maintain that momentum as we build uh, India's economy. Yes, there are discussions on manufacturing side and their discussion, can India really capture a supply chain coming out of China? And the answer is no at this stage. And, and the reason I say that is U.S. companies are not going to leave China because it's a large economy, large market. Uh, they will keep on building manufacturing in China for China. They will slow down and stop manufacturing for the world from China, and they'll explore geographies like Vietnam, uh, uh, India, Cambodia, and others area. So to answer your question, yes, on a services side, India can play a much more pivotal role, not only just helping its own economy, but global economy also. Thank you. I wanted to turn to, to Hank on this because you were speaking initially, Hank, about the Business Roundtable statement on the purpose of the corporation. And all of you as panellists are talking about the perception of human capital as an asset and a view of a worker in a different way and therefore thinking about a company in a different way and, that, and about the opportunities that we have in this moment for that. But again, these are kind of deep structural changes that are easier to, than said than done. So I'm curious, Hank, from your perspective, 
what are the operational challenges to achieving that different idea of the statement of a purpose of a corporation and for that to really become more than a statement of purpose and something that actually is happening within company. Well, let me do two things here. First is uh, agree with the previous comments. Uh, the opportunity for India as the world's largest English speaking country uh, and what people forget also extremely well educated. Uh, the strength of India is not only in the people, it's in the educated people uh, and very motivated people. So all of that is correct. The challenge of the current time is there's the trend in the major economies, China and uh, the United States in particular, to not completely decouple, but to bring jobs home, to be less dependent on foreign suppliers. Uh, and COVID-19, frankly, is encouraging those sentiments. Uh, I don't think they're right uh, to really understand the benefits of globalization. Uh, you must realize that the definitive book on this topic was written 150 years ago. And you don't even have to read the book. You just have to read the title. The title is The Wealth of Nations. That is the source of wealth, and it's countries cooperating, not opposing each other. We haven't quite convinced the politicians of this yet. Uh, so, a second topic. Uh, it certainly is true that uh, parts of society, in, led initially by investors, are pushing private, the private sector, large corporations in particular, to change the way they behave. And we're seeing this start to happen. The problem with this is twofold. Number one are the metrics. We know how to hold management accountable for sales growth and earnings growth and return on capital. I'm not sure we know how to, how to uh, motivate, incentivize, and hold management accountable for their role in the economy or income inequality or 10 other things I could, I could raise here. So the first problem was one of metrics. How do we measure the results? And the second is competing interests. Uh, almost any of the issues I've uh, mentioned here, uh, in the United States economy at least, uh, people are divided about 40% strongly for, 40% strongly against, and 20% don't know. So if you have uh, pressure from uh, investors or the general public, to deal with social issues, I don't know who you listen to. And if you listen to your employees, we've seen Google employees refusing to work on projects related to the U.S. government. We've seen Microsoft employees refusing to work on projects uh, related to the energy sector. Uh, there's some real challenges ahead. Is it going to be better? I'm absolutely convinced we're on the right track and the future is bright for everyone but it's not going to be easy. Thank you, Preetha. If I wanted to, to follow up on something that Hank was just talking about there with you, because you talked about um, opportunities also for um, the private sector to work more with government. Um, you talked about opportunities for things like older workers in this case. Um, what are the risks, though, that companies say all the right things in this moment in time? Like Hank was saying, they're responding to pressure from investors, from consumers. Consumers saying we want companies to, t to act in a different way. It's very easy to sort of say that you will as a company. Uh, what are the risks that they don't? Um, and and what's, what's the repercussions of that? Do you think that companies will really say we can structurally change here or do you think there's a risk that there's some lip service that occurs in this? Uh, you're muted still, Preetha. Can you hear me? Yeah, I think India as a country has a lot of very young companies, which again are driven by entrepreneurs who, you know, who started their companies and then grown them. And for them to change quickly and adapt is, is far easier than if it's a large conglomerate. And this dig digital transformation I'm seeing, seeing happening in the C-suites much quicker, faster, and the adoption of that is happening 
happening really well well in India and, and it will it will continue to happen. Working with the government I think has been a challenge, not because the government you know dislikes the private sector, but but it's been like so many years of you know the government doing everything. And it, and now they privatized airport and that airports and that relationships are doing well. They've privatized a lot of infrastructures, so, you know, you see roads being done by private sector. Now it's doing well. Uh, some of the sectors which are, you know, so-called the social sector, which is education and healthcare, it's taking a bit of time for the public-private partnerships to happen. But I, but I see it happening in the future simply because, I, you know, both the sectors need each other. The, the government needs the private sector uh, as far as healthcare is concerned because 80% of the work which is done or uh, 80% of the interventions in healthcare is done by the private sector because our numbers are huge and throughout the country it's, it's the private sector which does it. So the public sector really needs the private sector and now there needs to be really a meeting of ways. Where we do have you know challenges and issues is maybe the communication hasn't been done well enough. And, you know, those are the challenges that, you know, with a very so, uh, social sector mindset, uh, the, the communication hasn't been that great. And we also see that sometimes, you know, the media is kind of playing up one or two stray incidences. But this happens in a very young economy. As we go forward, uh, the, the need is so much between both and insurance has come in and I'm talking purely of you know my sector. We see that you know the meeting of ways will happen and going forward it will happen so much better. And as far as training is concerned and education is concerned, unless we change you know the basic norms, uh, earlier it was you needed to have uh, 30 acres of land just to run, run a medical school. But that has changed because, you know, the, the cost of land was so high and expensive. And now they're looking at, you know, leasing real estate. So different models are evolving. And with the virtual learning systems available, I think we would have a much more educated workforce than we had earlier. And definitely a lot of it is in English, which then gives us a global advantage. So I think in the skilling, we're doing so much better than before in working and you know overcoming the suspicion between public and private sector which has kind of held us back earlier that, that is getting better so I, I see these are the things which we need to be optimistic about thank you okay. your, your, your conversation your words about education bring me to a to the question i wanted to ask Vinny. actually um, when we think about human capital, you need people coming into the workforce with a base of skills and the best base of skills you can get is a good education. Uh, and yet COVID is layering a challenge onto, the, in, onto India's education system um, that was already facing many challenges, as you said, uh, especially in terms of rural schools, uh, your prediction that the dropout rate uh, for children by grade five will accelerate. Uh, what are the ways that you believe that India and other countries will need to tackle that? Uh, you've spoken of the challenges to the education sector. What do you believe are the actions that need to be taken now uh, to address that, to ensure that we are getting uh, that human capital uh, to the point where it can come into the workforce? I think uh, basically we can do three things. Uh, the first and the foremost is to understand the problem. Because right now in India and world over, we are diverting education resources towards healthcare, towards taking care of migrant population, towards distribution of uh, this issue or that issue. The teachers as a workforce is being used and diverted to be, uh, to assist in coronavirus fighting which is fine for a short period of time, but we must understand that it's a cost of a long-term growth of the country. And therefore, the first step for us is to recognize that we have a problem of a scale and size which is as large as coronavirus if we let it slip down the river as we are allowing it to do it right now. That's the first part of it, recognizing the problem. 
The second is leveraging the digital strategy. We are having a conference today, uh, largely digital. I think it is more convenient than getting into a room and having this conversation. The amount of time we waste to be able to get into the room, uh, this conversation quality is far superior, saves time, and you can get to what you wanted to say or wanted to hear very quickly. We need to adopt digital education in rural schools in a technology which is low in bandwidth, leverages video quality on low bandwidth very well, and it is local multilingual uh, languages. So that's the second part of it, is use technology in a way we can get the technology to a rural sector. Third, and I think the biggest part is innovation. You must understand India stands for massive innovation when it comes to leveraging limited resources to create larger impact. So what kind of education can we bring into the Indian education system where we are not focusing on learning outcomes, but we are focusing on learning? Where we are not focusing on numeracy and literacy skills, but we are, we are focusing on life skills and education skills which will give people jobs. What can we do in innovation to bring innovation into education so that people can make more out of what they have? And therefore, rewrite the curriculum and leverage the digital architecture and leverage the teachers who are back into school or back into the medium of digital education to be able to hold this slide downwards and use this opportunity to reverse the trend and solve a problem we have not been able to solve for the last four decades. Thank you. In fact, I'll, I'll circle back now to, to Preetha on, on, some, on that because you were talking about digital education and, and the way that the world will see digital platforms uh, and access in a different way. I'm, I'm a bit old school and I still prefer in-person interactions uh, and the ability to, to see people in person, but I appreciate that this is in this moment of COVID, uh, being able to even meet on a platform like this and discuss these issues is, a, is an advancement from 10, 20 years ago. Preetha, do you think that, that companies in India are prepared for the, the reality that a lot of business will be done digitally going forward? Are they prepared for their platforms in terms of selling their products um, for digital medicine, for example, and the way that healthcare will be delivered increasingly uh, over platforms like this going forward? Do you believe it, that companies in India are ready for that or are seeing the opportunities? I think uh, telemedicine, you know, with the lockdown has grown in leaps and bounds in India. Uh, we, on any given day, are doing about 2,000 teleconsults, telemed consults, which is, I think, a very large volume. In fact, rural India needed telemedicine and we're working with a lot of governments to run what is called an EPHC. So, you know, the public health centers have a telemedicine uh, you know, connection with, with the specialists in the hospitals. And this is picking up and doing extremely well. And, uh, you know, we're one of the, the highest location in India, somewhere in Uttaranchal, which is about, I think, 8,000 uh, feet about mean sea level. Uh, there's a whole community being looked after by uh, telemedicine. So I think the answer is that it has the technology is proven. Will it really replace the human touch of a doctor? I'm not so sure it ever will because while you can be high tech, uh, you still need that high touch. So it might minimize the number of interactions with, with the clinician. Uh, we have patients coming from, you know, all over the world for interventions. But when they go back, the follow-ups are done by telemedicine. So that part is taken care of. But I don't think we can completely obliterate the need for, you know, the human touch. Uh, and, and that is there in, um, you know, many of the, the sectors. But uh, retail, we, we see how farmers are using technology to bring their products into a marketplace. And that, I think, in, in India is a huge success story, that, you know, you can access farm uh, goods, farm produce from small-time farmers and then be able to, you know, uh, buy it and, and get it into the city. So I think some of those success stories 
our learnings for, for the rest of the world. Uh, healthcare, uh, e-pharmacies, uh, marketplace retail, these are all which are uh, success stories for us. But I'm sure going forward a lot will happen. The education using digital platforms um, has done very well. So even in the medical colleges, nursing colleges, we've all shifted to that. But there will be a time where you know they really have to work on the floors. And you can't replace that. A good doctor really has to work on the floors. A good nurse has to do it. So part of the education has to be physical. And, and that will happen post long. Thank you. So we have four minutes left um, and I have three questions. So I'm going to ask you all to, to try and give me an answer in 60 seconds flat. Uh, Hank, I wanted to come to you because we're seeing in this, in this moment, in some parts of the world at least, a greater state intervention in companies. In, in Europe, for example, coming in and intervening in companies. Do you believe that right now what we need is less regulation of companies and less state involvement or do you see them becoming more self-regulatory? What's your view on that? Well, there's a very old story about India, uh, which concluded that the economy grows at night while the government sleeps. Uh, things are a lot different today. Uh, in my experience, in many, many countries around the world, the cooperation coordination between government and business is exceptionally strong. Uh, the involvement of government today is not because they want greater control of business, but business needs help. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has disrupted operations to the extent that the continuing viability of, of major firms, many with many with national uh, importance, uh, is in doubt. So I think we're seeing a, a, a different circumstance right now. But in general, I think the cooperation between government and business is better than it's ever been. Thank you. And Dr. Adi, I wanted to come back to you because we're getting a lot of questions from people who are listening to this asking about Europe. Uh, we've talked about India in terms of China and the US and elsewhere, but saying that Europe is a place where India, perhaps Indian companies um, haven't looked um, enough, where there are greater opportunities and also for India in terms of its own country-based alliances and its strategic thinking to engage more with Europe. Uh, what are your thoughts? Well, India, uh, while it builds an alliance with the U.S. and the other quad, it cannot afford to ignore Europe. I think Europe, uh, with its presence between U.S. and India, is a large market for Indian companies. I think culturally, from a language perspective, uh, Indian companies have been shy uh, trying to reach out to Europe. But what we're seeing in the last 10 years is a much more a greater momentum coming in a cooperation between Indian companies and European companies. From a geopolitical perspective, we are saying India is reaching out to Europe, a strong relationship with France, Germany, and other larger economies itself. So to answer your question, yes, India should leverage Europe as it builds an economy post COVID. Thank you. And just finally, I'd like to come back to Vinay to wrap us up because something that you wrote recently I was quite struck by where you talked about how recessions are part of a business cycle. Um, and in these times like this, that, that cost cutting shouldn't start with cutting staff um, and that companies should view employees as assets, which is something I think that all our panelists have been, have been talking to. Could you sum up for us by telling us how does that pay off for companies in the longer term? What is, what is the upside for companies from viewing employees in that way going? I think very quickly, in the industrial age, we were focused on productivity, and therefore efficiency and cost-cutting was the right decision. In the digital age, we are focused on innovation. And innovation, fortunately, can only be done by the human mind. So therefore, if you have not treated your employees well at a critical juncture where they need it treated well, there is no way they will participate in innovation. Their cost speed will go down. So this is the time that the managers have to become leaders, have to demonstrate that they care for the employees. And if they care for their employees at this juncture, then the employees will care for them when the growth phase will come back, which will come back. And that is the time the employees will demonstrate and give you a higher return on investment than you ever conceptualized. 
Thank you. And with one second left, uh, we've come at it, we brought it in right on time. Um, there were many other questions that we would have liked to have had the chance to talk about, but I would like to thank you all for taking the time to join today. I hope the conversation has been useful for those who were listening um, and please enjoy the rest of the Horizons meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Raj.